All right, everyone. Good morning. How are we doing? Sweet. Uh, so this is our seminar. We're going to be talking about strength and hypertrophy principles. Uh, so let's get started. First thing we're going to discuss is our first topic is warm up. Uh, this is the outline. We're going to talk about why you should warm up. We're going to talk about the differences between a general and specific warm up. We're going to discuss uh, mobility and warm up exercises. Uh, we'll talk about warm up sets and how those differ from mobility and warm up exercises. Uh, we're going to touch on hypertrophy versus strength warm up differences. We're going to talk about warming up with pain. How should you vary your warm up if you are in pain or have aches and pains? And then we're going to touch on some passive modalities that may be helpful, especially if you are someone dealing with pain. So why warm up? Uh, warming up improves strength, range of motion, and movement quality. Uh, one of the things uh, by which it improves strength is sort of you wake your nervous system up or uh, neural priming. You also get the release of uh, fight or flight hormones or catecholamines. Uh, which help to uh, uh, promote strength and power. Uh, from warming up and just getting the tissues warm, uh, you increase range of motion, and you improve movement quality. Uh, you guys might have heard of muscle memory before. Uh, sometimes it's called motor learning, but basically as you do a given movement pattern, it gets smoother as you practice it. Uh, warming up also decreases injury risk and perceptions of fatigue. I don't know if anyone's ever uh, started a workout and felt a little bit unmotivated to train for whatever reason that day. You get into your warm up, uh, perhaps you get a little bit into your actual workout and you start to feel a little bit better. Uh, that's sort of the perception of fatigue decrease that we're talking about with a good warm up. So, warm up components. Uh, we have two different components that we can break a warm up into. We have a general warm up, which involves uh, steady state cardio, normally for about five or so minutes. Uh, this is useful because it warms the body up. It can also help decrease pain and soreness. Um, it's probably less important from a performance aspect because I touched on this a little bit. In terms of promoting movement quality, you want to make sure that you're doing the specific movements and exercises that you're going to be doing in your actual workout. And that sort of brings us to a specific warm-up. Uh, this involves movements specific to the task uh, done at a gradually increasing intensity. Um, so this includes some mobility work, warm-up exercises, and sometimes these can be the same thing. Um, and then after those, we have our actual warm-up sets for our given lift for the first part of our workout. So mobility and warm-up exercises. I think the big thing here is don't just do random mobility work or random band work. Have some intention behind what you're doing. Uh, mobility work should address some sort of uh, movement restriction, some lack of range of motion. You should be getting some sort of gains from the mobility work you're doing. Uh, in that same sort of vein, warm-up exercises should address some sort of weakness, some sort of poor motor control. Um, and or uh, pain, because contracting the muscle sort of has a pain relieving effect if you are someone who's dealing with pain. So specific mobility and warm up. Uh, we're going to provide some examples. Uh, shoulder pain is pretty common, especially in the weight room. Uh, so if you, know, if you have a little bit of shoulder pain or your shoulders are tight, here are some good things you can do uh, in your warm up. Uh, so I recommend starting with some rotator cuff work. Uh, this can be with a light band. Just get into external rotation. You can do an external rotation isometric and sort of press it up into flexion as well. All of that stuff helps to turn your rotator cuff on. Uh, also working some of the uh, muscles around your scapula. This can include rows, face pulls, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, a little bit of spinal mobility. Uh, so your shoulder or your shoulder blade sits on your rib cage. And as you move your shoulder, uh, your scapula moves along your rib cage. So if you can't get into a lot of thoracic extension, uh, working on some mobility or warm-up exercises, sort of like thread the needle, cat-cow, that sort of thing can help get more thoracic extension, improve your shoulder mechanics. 
Another example that I think is uh, a, uh, really important for uh, gym goers is uh, low back pain, especially if we have any power lifters or anything like that in here. It's a really common cause of pain in the weight room. Uh, so we're going to work on some spinal mobility, uh, some prone press-ups where you guys might be familiar with cobras, pushing back up into extension, uh, some cat-cows working on uh, segmentation of some of those uh, spinal segments. Uh, we want to do some core strength stuff, uh, such as bird dogs, dead bugs. We also want to work on some hip mobility because everything is attached to each other in the body. So we want to make sure that we're doing deep squats, lunges, warming up our hip because that's going to help warm up our back and help decrease some of that back pain. So now that we've talked about mobility exercises, um, let's move on to warm up sets. So this is what, uh, your first workout movement that's a part of your actual workout. Uh, if, if you're doing squat, bench, or deadlift, you guys absolutely should be warming up with the bar. Uh, if you watch any good power lifter or Olympic weight lifter, they start with the bar and then they gradually increase their weight. And as they get closer to their working weight, uh, the jumps are smaller because it's a larger percentage uh, in terms of that breakdown. Uh, if you are doing barbell work, it's probably going to require more sets uh, just because this typically involves going up to a higher weight. Um, so let's say you've finished your, your first big main movement or a uh, couple main big movements and you're on to your accessory work. Should you be doing three, four sets of, let's say, lateral raises to get your shoulders warmed up? Probably not. You're, you're probably good with what we like to call one feeder set. So this can be uh, the same weight that you're going to use or even a little bit lighter and just sort of feel how the weight's moving that day. Go through that range of motion. Do it real quick, five, six reps and then move on uh, to the main lift in terms of your accessories. Uh, warming up from a hypertrophy, a hypertrophy focus is different than a strength focus. And hypertrophy is all about building muscle size. So it's about the muscle, not necessarily about the movement. Uh, hypertrophy focus requires fewer sets, and these are done at moderate load, so we're gonna have fewer warm up sets than with strength. Uh, this can be less movement specific than with strength work because the muscle is the goal, not necessarily the movement. So focus on the target muscle, trying to feel that mind-muscle connection, hitting the working muscle, the target muscle, that is the goal. Um, in terms of technique, uh, focus on getting a big stretch, controlling the weight on the eccentric or the lowering portion, uh, and focus on building tons of tension in that target muscle. How about strength? Uh, now strength is about the movement and the weight you're using, uh, not necessarily about isolating muscles. So with a strength focus, it's gonna require more sets because strength involves going to higher loads to build that strength. So focus should be on technique. Again, but it, this differs from hypertrophy because the, the technique aspect is more about being efficient. Um, you also want to focus on bar speed. If you watch any good power lifter, Olympic weight lifter warm up, every single set they do is crisp, fast, and aggressive. And this carries over to your actual working sets. Uh, and if you are someone who competes, make sure you're warming up to competition standards because uh, you want to uh, do the same you're going to do on the platform on meet day. So warming up with pain. How can a warm up help decrease pain? Uh, so I think a general warm-up here can be really useful because it increases body temperature, releases some of those uh, pain-relieving endorphins. Uh, it also helps to clear some local inflammation. Um, mobility work is also useful. Uh, it helps you ease into a painful range of motion and slowly increasing the range of motion in a painful range of motion. It helps to desensitize some of those painful areas. Uh, Warm-up exercises, I touched on this a little bit, but contracting the muscle around a painful area can help uh, provide sort of that analgesic or pain-relieving effect to that given area. And then warm-up sets, uh, if you are dealing with pain, make sure uh, that you're evaluating how you're feeling in your warm-up sets. Your warm-up warm -up sets are a good proxy to see, okay, do I need to step on the brake or am I good to step on the gas today? So how much pain is too much? When do we sort of need to step on the brake when we feel like something's just sort of off? 
So I encourage you guys to listen to your body. If something really does feel off or it doesn't feel right, uh, take a second and evaluate that because you don't want to make it worse. And if you are dealing with pain that you don't think you, you should be pushing through that day, consider adapting your training. Tyler's going to talk about some really good strategies to help adapt your training and we're going to get into that later. Uh, and if you think you are dealing with you know, some pain that's you know, above what you're able to deal with on your own or a more serious injury, uh, go see a physical therapist or a medical doctor. Uh, bonus points if your provider lifts because they're probably going to be able to relate to you and help you in your given situation a little bit better. Uh, so what about foam rolling, massage, massage guns? I know we have foam rollers back there. Does it work? Uh, the thing with any of these passive modalities is it can provide short-term pain relieving effect and short-term increases of range of motion. Uh, but I do encourage you guys to use that as sort of a band-aid. You're not fixing the root cause of the pain or the mobility restriction. So active mobility work, warm-up exercises, and progressive warm-up uh, sets should really be the mainstay of your warm-up. So do we have any questions on uh, the, the warm-up section? Any, anything uh, you guys want clarified or anything? Sweet. We're going to move on to hypertrophy training. So we're going to go over some terms first. We're going to talk about choosing exercises. We're going to talk about how much you should be training, training fre frequency. And then we're going to discuss training splits. We're also going to talk about weights and reps, how this relates to hypertrophy training. We're going to discuss volume recommendations. We're going to talk about how, how long you should be resting in between your sets to get the uh, biggest increase in muscular size. Uh, then we're going to talk, on, uh, talk about technique for hypertrophy training. And then we're going to finish up with uh, how to get the most out of your hy hypertrophy training when you're not actually in the gym. So here are some must-know terms. Uh, hypertrophy, of, of course, is increasing in muscle size. Progressive overload means that you're doing more than you did last time, uh, doing more than you did last week in your training block. And this involves increasing weight, reps, or sets, or some combination of all of those. A training block is a four to eight week cycle where you're implementing progressive overload uh, from week one till the end of your block. A deload is what you should do at, after your training block when you can no longer implement progressive overload and you've sort of tapped out uh, increases in weight, sets, and reps. Uh, reps and reserve is a really useful tool uh, for uh, prescribing intensity. And what reps and reserve mean is just how many reps you are away from failure. We're gonna touch on how you can use that in your training to guide your intensity a little bit later. So types of hypertrophy exercise. We have barbell and dumbbell compound movements. Uh, these are great because they work a ton of muscles at once, they use higher loads, and they're really stimulating from a hypertrophy standpoint. But with that uh, muscle stimulation, you also build up a decent amount of fatigue. This is where uh, machine work can come in. Machines are great because they help to isolate muscle groups, they have built-in stabilization, and they're less fatiguing. Uh, sort of the same way with barbell and dumbbell accessories, and by accessories I mean just sort of lighter movements, so these can be lateral raises, stuff with the cables, uh, that sort of thing. And cables are great because they also isolate muscles, uh, they allow a little bit of creativity, you can move where the pin's at to hit stuff from different angles, and again they're less fatiguing than our compound movements. So what is the, the best exercise? Uh, is there one given exercise that's going to really make all the progress in the world for you? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, so start with uh, variations of classic hypertrophy movements, uh, such as uh, pressing movements, shoulder press, uh, bench press, and try these with, you know, figure out what works best for you, and then vary it. Maybe it works better for you with dumbbells, a barbell, a cable. Try to figure out what gives you the highest stimulation and the lowest amount of fatigue. Um, make sure that you are swapping out your exercises uh, every so often. Uh, let's say you do uh, dumbbell bench for like a year. At some point, dumbbell bench isn't going to be quite as stimulating as it was when you first started. 
movements get stale over time. We get used to them. So we need to make sure that we're mixing things up every so often. Um, but how do we know if an exercise is effective for us? What are some uh, sort of proxies we can use? So here are some signs that an exercise is effective for you. Uh, the, the first thing is you get a ton of blood in the target muscle. You guys probably know about getting a pump. If you get a really big pump from a movement, it's probably a good movement. It's probably one that you should keep in your program. Uh, also disruption in the muscle. So this means you train the muscle and it gets weaker. So let's take a leg day for example. If you have a really good leg day and you go to walk up the stairs after your leg day, you guys might be familiar with the stairs feeling a little bit different than they did two days prior when your legs were fully recovered. And that's what we're talking about with disruption in the muscle. It should feel different, it should feel like you hit it. Um, also, you need to make sure that this is an exercise that you can progress in weight sets or reps. Um, and here are some tools to see uh, if an exercise probably isn't effective. Uh, there's no pump, you can't really feel the target muscle, uh, it feels like all joints, so let's say you're doing, doing a bench press and all you feel is your elbows and your shoulder a little bit and you don't really feel your chest, maybe you should switch up the variation that you're doing uh, for bench press. Maybe switch it to dumbbells or something like that. Um, yeah, and if you don't like the exercise, it is okay to just not do it and find one that you like better because that's going to help you guys with adherence. So, how do we order our exercises? We should start with our heavy compound movements first. Uh, we want to do these first because at the beginning of our workout, we're going to be at our strongest and we're going to have the lowest amount of fatigue. We're going to want to move on to our heavy accessory movements next. This could be, so let's take a bench day for example, this might be some light dumbbell shoulder pressing. So you'd want to do that next. And then you'd want to switch to your lighter accessory movements. So after you've done bench, maybe some dumbbell shoulder press, maybe that's a good time to do your lateral raises or dumbbell skull crushers. Uh, another option that I think is really, really good for hypertrophy is if you have a muscle group you're trying to bring up, train that muscle first. Uh, so let's take the example, you're trying to get bigger biceps and you're doing a back and bicep day. If you always train your biceps after an entire, let's say four back movements, three sets each, you're gonna be pretty fatigued by the time that you get to your first set of dumbbell curls. So putting the curls first and the bicep work first, even though it isn't the heaviest movement, can really be beneficial from a hypertrophy standpoint if bring, bringing up your biceps is the main goal. Exercise selection. Uh, so let's just go over a quick summary. Uh, find movements that are effective for you as an individual and reassess this over time because again, exercises do get stale. Do your compound movements first or have a priority muscle group that you're training first to get the biggest benefits. Utilize a mixture of barbell, dumbbell, uh, machines, cables, they all provide different benefits. So to get the biggest benefits, we want to use a, a big variety of these uh, movements. Um, and again, vary your exercises because movements do get stale. Don't be the person that does the same exact exercise order of the same exact exercises for like a year or two. You guys need to mix it up. So how often should we be training? Uh, so some general guidelines are don't train the same muscle group uh, within 48 to 72 hours. When we train, we break muscle tissue down. And when we rest, that's when we build it back up in recovery. Um, so make sure that you are recovered again before you hit a given muscle group. Uh, how often you should be training also varies by how long you've been training. So if you're newer to the gym, let's say you have, you've only been lifting for two, three months, you're probably okay with doing uh, two to three workouts a week, maybe doing full body. Uh, that's gonna give you a, some pretty good results. Uh, if you've been training a little bit longer, uh, you need to increase your frequency uh, because you've already sort of adapted to that baseline two to three days a week. Uh, and same thing with being, uh, if, if you've been training for a long time, you've been in the gym for a couple years, the recommendation is to train for four to seven times per week. 
So workout splits, what's the best workout split? Is it push pull legs? Is it the Arnold bro split, which is chest, back, legs, arms, upper body, lower body? Um, what works best? Uh, really, I think workout splits are probably one of the, the least important variables when it comes to program design. Uh, any split can work so long as you have an adequate amount of time to recover. Uh, so there is no magic split. If someone's trying to tell you they have the best exercise, the best split for you, and it's based on your body type, run far, far away, because they probably don't know what they're talking about. So rep ranges. Uh, we used to recommend training only in the 6 to 12 rep range for hypertrophy. But we do have more research saying that training in some higher rep ranges can also be effective. Uh, and this includes the 6 to 20 rep range. Uh, there are some benefits to uh, training with low reps. Uh, you can use heavier weight, but it is a little bit more fatiguing because you are using heavier weight. Uh, there are some benefits to high rep sets. Uh, you can use uh, lighter weight. Um, and so that can help if you're dealing with pain or just say, you know, a little bit more variation. Uh, but if you're doing all your movements with 20 reps, you're probably going to be pretty tired by the time that you finish your workout. So that's a consideration we want to take into account. So how do we choose our rep range? Because 6 to 20 is a really big range. Uh, I recommend that you guys try different rep ranges, vary your rep range. Uh, we do have some research that does say that when we vary our rep range, uh, it actually helps to promote uh, gains in muscle size. Uh, importantly, and I think this is a huge note here, proximity to failure or reps in reserve, as we sort of talked about, is probably more important from a hypertrophy standpoint than how many reps you're actually doing. So you want to make sure that you're staying around two to three reps shy away from failure. Um, yeah, and making reps in reserve, like using it in your training, trying it out, can be really, really helpful. So I do definitely recommend you guys give that a shot. So how do we vary our rep range for hypertrophy? Uh, this requires you need to mix your weight up so you can still be around the same sort of uh, proximity to failure, that two to three reps away from muscular failure. Uh, use reps in reserve to help guide this. Um, and you can syst uh, systematically change your rep ranges with your training block. So you could do, let's say, block one here. So this is a four to six week. Uh, you're, you're training for hypertrophy here. You could do 8 to 12 reps, and then your next block, you mix it up a little bit. You do 10 to 15 reps. Then block 3, you mix it up a little bit more and do 12 to 20, and then kind of switch back and vary that. How much weight should we be using for hypertrophy? So if we're tw uh, training with uh, 6 to 20 reps, uh, this is going to require loads around 60, 60 to 85% of our one rep max. And you guys can kind of check this table out here. Uh, you can Google one rep max chart or Prelopin's chart. Any of those will give that up. And basically what it does is it gives you, uh, so 100% of your one rep max, you're going to be able to do one. And then it gives you a breakdown in, uh, in terms of percentage of that weight, how many reps you could do that would put you at uh, pretty close to failure. Uh, compound movements should be heavier, so we do want to typically train these in the, in the 6 to 12 rep range because this requires training at uh, around 75 to 85 percent of our one rep max. Um, and I, I think a good example here is if anyone's ever tried to do 20 reps on squat, uh, your legs aren't going to be the limiting factor. Your lungs might be, or your low back might be. Uh, so we want to take that into account that uh, the muscle that we're trying to hit is the limiting factor and not another variable. Uh, accessory work. Uh, this should be lighter, and I recommend using reps in reserve for this instead of a percent-based system uh, because it's kind of hard. Like, uh, it, Does anyone know their one rep max lateral raise in here? I, I don't. Uh, so yeah, reps in reserve is probably a better tool for that. Um, again, stay within two to three reps away from failure. So uh, hypertrophy versus strength, how does the weight matter? Uh, so with hypertrophy train, uh, training, it's, it, it isn't strength training. Uh, hypertrophy training, the weight is a tool to help hit that muscle, to stimulate that muscle. 
Whereas with strength training, the weight and the weight in that movement is the actual goal. So I think that's just a really important point to keep in mind. Uh, progressive overload, another really important topic uh, for hypertrophy and for strength both. Uh, start training blocks off with enough room to increase over the coming weeks. Make sure that uh, your first week, you have you know, three, four weeks to increase weight, sets, or reps. Give yourself some place to go in your training block. Um, yeah, so I mean, week one should be less hard than week two, and week four should be the hardest if you're running a four-week block. So weight reps and progressive overload summary. Uh, train with reps uh, between six to 20. Uh, train with a variety of rep ranges that you're changing over time. Uh, train with intensity. Train about two to three reps away from failure. Uh, implement progressive overload from week to week by increasing weight, sets, or reps. Uh, when progressive overload is maxed out, this is the time that you guys should be deloading. Drop some of that fatigue. Give yourself a week to recover. Start back low on, uh, let's say, uh, after your block, after your deload, you start back. We're going to call that week one. Make sure that you're giving yourself enough room to ramp it up again. Volume. Uh, so we define volume as how many hard sets you're doing uh, per a muscle group per week. Uh, we do have some research saying that 12 to 20 is, uh, is a good volume recommendation, uh, but in the past couple years we've had more research come out that says training uh, closer to 20 to 30 reps if you're more, uh, more like someone who's been training in the gym for a while, sort of uh, the same way with frequency, uh, that volume does need to go up. So we talked about this a little bit just now, but optimal uh, volume does vary by how long you've been training. Beginners require less volume. If you've been training for longer, you probably require more volume. But do play around with it. Track how many sets you're doing uh, per week so you can sort of uh, gauge your training and have some sort of metric uh, to base your training on. Uh, yeah, 12 to 20 uh, may be optimal for a beginner to admit. Intermediate, uh, 20 to 30 might be better for more advanced lifters. Uh, and we do have some crazy research. There was one study that looked at uh, leg extensions and they had participants do 52 sets of leg extensions per week. And they did find uh, that there was an increase in, in quad size the most in that high volume group. So if you are training with really high volumes, you're probably gonna have to drop volume somewhere else. But if you've been training for a really long time, that's something to take into consideration. So how long should you be resting in between your sets? Uh, we used to go off of around 30 seconds to around two minutes. That guideline comes from the National Strength and Condition Conditioning Association. Uh, but we do have more research saying that longer rest might be better, especially with larger movements. And this can be from three minutes to five minutes. So some practical recommendations I want to give you guys include rest long enough to be able to push your next set as hard as your program sets or however long you, know, you want on that given day. And this can be anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes. And I got a little infographic here. Uh, it basically just shows... Uh, this was a study that looked at a one-minute rest versus a five-minute rest, and they did find around uh, four hours after exercise that there was an increase in muscle protein synthesis in the, uh, in the group that rested for five minutes in the group that rested longer. So, uh, you know, that, that can also uh, lead to training a little bit longer, so, so play around with how long you need to be resting. Uh, you know, that does vary based on you as an individual. Um, in terms of technique, um, there's only a couple notes here and it's really important that you master the basics. Uh, the majority of your lifts should be done through a full range of motion. Uh, this helps to build good technique and good habits in the weight room. Uh, another point is control the eccentric. Um, hypertrophy literature does point to the fact that the eccentric contraction or the lowering phase is likely more muscle stimulating than the concentric. So make sure that we're getting a ton out of the eccentric, uh, around like a three minute lowering eccentric. And then on the concentric or the, the moving up portion or the, the muscle shortening uh, portion, we want to be fast and explosive through that range of motion. Uh, 
Also, try to get a big stretch on your eccentric. Uh, there's been some research on stretch-mediated hypertrophy. So training muscles at uh, long lengths tends to be uh, more beneficial from a hypertrophy standpoint than training at uh, short muscle lengths. So in terms of a bicep curl, that would mean this, this would be a long muscle length here at the bottom, and then this would be a short muscle length. So this range of motion is likely more hypertrophic than this range of motion. So how can we practically use that in our training? So this is more of an advanced technique, uh, but we do have some research on long length partials. Uh, so consider using long length partials as an intensity technique, and this would, uh, for the example of bicep curls, this would just be doing bicep curls in this range of motion and partial reps. Uh, this can be nice to help mix up your training, uh, but do uh, ease into this, this technique if you haven't used it before. Uh, you will get really sore. Uh, it, it does make a pretty big difference. Uh, so do play around with it. Uh, and don't do a ton of long length partials uh, your first go around. So hypertrophy outside the gym. How can we maximize what we're doing here in the gym when uh, we're at home, we're at school, we're at work? Uh, nutrition is a huge, huge factor. Make sure that you're getting one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Uh, if you are trying to put on size, it is better to be in a calorie surplus. Uh, you're good to be in a 200 to 300 calorie surplus. Uh, there have been studies that looked at bigger surpluses, but they've pretty much found that just a slight surplus seems to be as effective as a larger one. Uh, sleep is another important factor. Make sure that you're sleeping seven to nine hours a night. Uh, if you're getting less than seven hours of sleep, it's actually been shown to blunt muscle protein synthesis and also increase uh, your risk of injury. Um, and then finally, manage your stress. Uh, stress in the gym and stress out there in life, all of it uh, is, is sort of the same thing when it comes to hypertrophy. Uh, so when you're not training, chill out, uh, take it easy if you can. Uh, here are some resources uh, that, I, that I've found really useful for myself uh, in terms of learning about uh, training for muscle size. I think the guys at Renaissance Periodization do a really good job. They're on YouTube. They have a ton of really good information. Uh, Jeff Nippard's been around for a long time. He still puts out great videos. Uh, Wolf Coaching, he's sort of a newer dude. Uh, he's actually done a decent amount of the long length partial studies. So he's a good dude to follow. Uh, some websites include uh, mentalhenselman.com, uh, uh, another researcher, does a lot of good work. Uh, same with the Stronger by Science guys. So yeah, that sort of wraps up uh, hypertrophy training in a nutshell as well as warm up. So does anyone have any questions on anything or anything you want clarified? All right, Tyler's gonna take it away. put this mic on here really quick. So, first thing that I'm gonna have you guys do, can you guys scoot forward for me so I don't have to yell quite as loud? I know you guys up front can definitely hear, but you guys in the back, I'm not that loud, especially if I'm talking for 40 plus minutes. So everyone just scoot forward, watch out for the cables on this side here. Yeah, and you guys on this end can even come in closer. We wanna build kind of a wall, build a wall. Yeah, I like it. I will say, you back there guarding the bikes, I appreciate it. Those bikes are very loud, so if you could stay there, that would be awesome. All right, so as you can see, we had to make some last minute adjustments for our projector and everything. So like some of my text might be shifted and in weird places and everything, but one last time, let's give it up for Sam. All right, so we're gonna see if this clicker here will work. All right. So my outline for the next 30 to 45 minutes, there's a lot of objectives here, but I'm just gonna walk through them. First of all, I'm talking about strength training. Define what it is, goals of strength training, important factors that influence your strength. Discuss proper volume and loading for strength adaptations and explain two common ways to progress or periodize your programming. Next up is gonna be optimizing your recovery. Discuss sleep and how it affects your recovery, basic nutrition concepts, recommended protein targets, Sam touched on that just a little bit for hypertrophy gains. And then I'm gonna explain the need for well-managed programming. 
And then lastly, this is a little bit of a plus little section here that I added in, programming through injury. It's not gonna take that long, it's only like six slides, but I think it's important to touch on. So, what is it? Don't read it. Don't, don't, focus. But what is it, seriously? It's the amount of force that your muscles can produce, right? Hypertrophy is growing the muscle, but strength is how much force can that specific muscle group or multi-joint movement, how much force can you produce, right? So it's very similar to power, and they're often used inconsistently, like for the term power lifters, right? We're not focused on speed with power lifting, it's still force output, right? So it should be called strength lifting, not power lifting. But you need to realize that power has an explosive component to it because it's the amount of work you do over time, right? So it's about how fast you move that weight. With strength, we're not concerned about speed. We wanna be explosive, but the most important part is how much weight can you move? So what's our primary goal? I kind of just said it. Increase the amount of force our muscles can produce, AKA move more weight with whatever movement that you're doing in that session. What is not the goal of strength training? Anyone know? What's that? Yeah, exactly. We're not showing up every time to the gym and slapping on as much weight as possible just to see how strong we are. That is not how we progress, okay? So it's important to calm yourself down, take it one week at a time, and not just, hey, I'm gonna see how much I can bench today and do that every session, okay? That's not what strength training is. So how do we meet this goal for increasing strength output? That's what I'm gonna talk about today, how we program for it and how we progress. Come on. Sorry guys, I'll just come up here like Sam was. So, how and when do we start? It depends on multiple factors. These are all things that you should be asking yourself if you're considering starting a strength training block, okay? Training status, how long have you been training? This kind of plays into this one here with technique experience, right? You need to have that good experience if you're gonna be loading up those movements really heavily. Next is current programming. Are you a swimmer right now? Are you just doing endurance activities? Are you in a hypertrophy block and need to transition to a strength block? That all matters. Then, of course, your age, because that you know, varies loading and varies how much volume you can take throughout the week. And then frequency. How often can you get into the gym to do a strength workout, right? All of those things are super important to look at. So now, what defines it? What defines strength training? I know you can't really see, but it's a guy doing a squat, okay? That's gonna be important here in just a second. Core exercise. So when I say core exercise, what do you guys think that means? Does that mean I'm doing sit-ups? Am I gonna do planks? No, no, core exercise is defined as loading your spine either directly or indirectly. See, this is why I need my clicker. Directly would be the squat, like this guy here, where you're actually axially loading the spine. That is a core movement for strength progression. Indirectly would be something like deadlifts or even hang cleans, power cleans, anything that's not directly on top of the spine, but you still have to have your musculature of your trunk contracted in order to complete that lift successfully. Little tidbit here that I wanted to throw in. Once again, I'm sorry if I'm blocking you guys out. I'm trying to include you all. Um, but this doesn't mean that we can't do accessory lifts. Accessory lifts are still very, very important for strength training, um, just as Sam was talking about with hypertrophy. Accessories are really important, right? But our primary focus should be shifted to these core exercises of loading your squat, loading your deadlift, loading your cleans, whatever, right? So, oh. Please show up. No! Okay, so <laughs> I had two sessions. I had session A and session B. Let me see really quick. Okay, pretend you guys see this. Uh, so on and so forth, okay? So you see A and B. I don't know, if, can you guys see that okay? Okay, like I said, there was technical difficulties all morning this morning. We had to change the color of our slides and stuff. So anyway, B or A, what one do you guys think is more beneficial for strength adaptations? 
Does anyone have a guess? Okay. You guys have an idea, at least in your head? Okay. Let me explain why it's not A. It is not A because you're leading off with some accessory movements, more isolated movements, right? You're gonna be fatigued, your legs are gonna be tired. Even if you're doing it for a slight warm up just to get the, the legs moving, the amount of force you can produce on your squat, which is a core movement, will be decreased, right? And that is not the goal of strength training. We wanna start with our core exercise so we can load it up the most amount throughout our entire session, right? And then throughout this, then you can prioritize, okay, do I need to bring up my quads? Are my hamstrings really weak? Then you can prioritize the next ones after the core exercise, okay? So, sorry about that, but that was supposed to be like a little uh, quiz for you guys, but it didn't show up. So, this is just explaining the last slide, um, why you do ex uh, not do accessory movements before a compound exercise because you're able to put the most effort in the first exercise of the session, so just start with the core exercise. Make it simple for yourself. So now we get into the fun stuff. This table's really important, but I'm gonna walk through it a little bit, so I'm gonna have to keep clicking a little bit here. Strength and power overlap a lot here, as you can see. So it goes strength, power, hypertrophy, which Sam talked about, and then muscular endurance. And these are the common areas for the rep ranges where it is most beneficial, where you see the most adaptations, right? So power and strength overlap a lot, and strength can happen anywhere on this repetition continuum. It can happen all along, all the way down to one rep, all the way up to 20. But where is it biggest? Where is it the biggest, and where do you see those, the best adaptations, basically? Two to six for strength, right here. The cutoff is about around six. Of course, it might bleed over into seven a little bit, but then you might start training more hypertrophy, right? Because then it comes down to how much can you load that lift? If you're gonna be lifting it 12 times, how much can you load it? You can't load it that much if you're doing 12 reps. So we wanna stick in the two to six rep range for the best strength adaptations, okay? Now for sets. What's really cool about strength exercise is that I'm not a genius by any stretch of the imagination, and if I can do it, it's really simple to follow, right? So everyone here should be able to do it. So, research has shown that doing multiple sets without reaching failure is better than single set training, and that optimal strength gains occur between two to six sets of a multi-joint exercise. So, reps, sets, I know this just says equal or less than six, right? I like the two to six range for strength, and then sets, two to six. How easy is that? Your sets, two to six, reps, two to six. That's easy to remember, right? Like I said, I am not a genius, so. The next topic is rest periods. Talking about rest periods, it's similar to the research that Sam was talking about, where increased rest times have been shown to lead to more hypertrophy, more strength overall. So, for younger individuals, three to five minutes is fantastic, but there has been new research, more research coming out, even more recent than that, that for older individuals, shorter rest is better, even if you are strength training. One to three minutes is even beneficial. So, what about load? Here we go. So, highly debated topic. However, the sources that I have used say anywhere from 80 to 100% of your one rep max. This is the optimal load for strength training, but does that mean you have to one rep max in order to get your percentages? Yes, no? No, you can do a three rep max and then use an online calculator to get your one rep max and then get your percentages off of that one, right? So you don't need to do a one rep max if you're not comfortable, if you don't have a really good spotter, if you train alone, anything like that, do a five rep max and then use those online calculators to get a one rep max and start training in this, 80 to 100% of your one rep max. I said all of these things. Okay, and then these last two are very similar to Sam's, where I say give yourself space each week to progress. If I start out at 97% of my one rep max and I'm trying to do three, three reps with it, am I gonna be able to progress that next week? Probably not, I'm gonna be really sore first of all, and then I don't have a lot of room to progress the following week, because I'll be at damn near 100%, right? So give yourself space, 
start low, maybe around the 80 or even 78 is still a good place to start and then progress each week, right? Being able to increase it weekly. Okay. Wow. Okay. So I had cons here for percentage-based and RPE, but we'll just talk through those a little bit. So for percentage-based, I'm a huge advocate for percentage-based training. I think it is more objective and it get, it's easier to track week to week, right? It gives a set goal weight and the optimal load increase week to week is 2.5 to 5%, right? So if I'm squatting 100 pounds one week, increase it by 2.5 2 to 5%. If you can do that math in your head, I can't, right? So what are some cons of percentage-based? Anyone know? Any guesses? The increase could be too big. If you're training yourself and you're like, oh, I need a 5% increase or even a 2.5% increase, then you're like, oh man, I'm supposed to hit this weight, but I'm still really sore. I'm still really sore. What if I can't make that jump? Even if it's 10 pounds, right? So that's one con. But then I wanna move down into RPE. Subjective perception of difficulty. RPE is rate of perceived exertion. Basically, how hard was it on a scale of one to 10, okay? The weight is adjusted based on feel. That's another pro of using RPE. So it's good for strength training and accessory movements alike because it takes into account all aspects of somebody's life, whether it's fatigue from work, poor sleep, nutrition, uh, their past training session was really, really hard. So then with RPE, we can say, okay, you're only gonna increase your weight until you hit an RPE of eight, right? That's still a really hard set because it's eight out of 10, but they get to judge that but based on how it feels, right? So like I said, I had cons. If I can find it on my slide, I'll come back to it because I had like a big list of like cons of percentage-based versus uh, RPE. Um, once again, <laughs> I'll say one con for RPE is not a lot of people know what a true RPE 10 feels like, right? I don't know if any of you guys have actually felt a true RPE 10. It feels like you want to throw up, right? like your legs are about to fall off. You wanna cry almost, right? So that's really hard and that kind of plays into training experience and how much time they've spent in the gym to actually know, okay, this is an RPE eight, this is an RPE nine, this is what a 10 feels like, right? So it's really hard to judge that. So it's kind of a, a toss up. There's pros and cons to both, but I, even for my athletes that I train, I really like percentage because they can look on their phone and be like, oh, I have to hit 285 pounds on bench this week. That's my goal. There you go. That number's already in their head. So basic rule for strength training and also this plays into hypertrophy as well, but we need to be increasing load and decreasing volume, right? So here, your prep period, you don't really have to follow these because this leads to a competition period where your intensity should be highest and your volume should be lowest but maybe this is just where you wanna max out, right? So if you're planning a, a training block, then you just do, okay, month one, month two, month three. I wanna max at the end of month three, for example. So that's when the loads should be heaviest and then the volume should be lowest. What do we do to drop the volume? Drop the sets, drop the reps, do a mix of them, whatever it might be. So rapid review of strength training. Let me click through these. Here we go. Most important factors, heavy load, 80 to 100% of your one rep max. Sets of two to six, reps of two to six. Super easy, I know, I love it. Progressive overload using RPE or percentage. Like I said, I can come back to it if there's more questions on that later. And then decrease volume over time, that last graph that I showed you, right? Lower the reps or the sets as the weights get heavier. That's a very basic rule to follow. So. Switching gears a little bit. I've been talking for a minute. You guys doing okay? Any questions? Right now? Okay, cool. Well, cool. I hope you can hear. If not, seriously, come up closer. I'm sorry, it's still pretty loud, but cool. Yeah, extra seat up here too, if anyone wants it. Okay. So now we're gonna be talking about optimizing recovery and some of the biggest factors for recovery. Sam talked about this with hypertrophy training. I'm just gonna add a little bit more detail, okay? So I'm talking about sleep, nutrition that matches your goals, and well-designed programs. So first of all, sleep. 
eight hours recommended. Sam said, gave that, that range of seven to nine. Uh, eight is still recommended for most people to decrease injury risk and promote muscle uh, protein synthesis. Okay, so right here, I just wanna point this out. Consecutive nights of sleep deprivation leads to decreased force output from multi-joint movements. What does that sound like? Strength, that literally says decreased force output for multi-joint movements. You guys remember the multi-joint movements, the core exercises, right? If you're decreasing your force on those, you're not getting good strength benefits at all, right? So what can you do to optimize your sleep then? I want you just for a second to think, you don't have to say it out loud, but think of three things you could do when you get home tonight to optimize your sleep. Make you fall asleep quicker maybe, maybe wake up on time, not snooze your alarm, not wake up in the middle of the night to have to go to the bathroom. What are three things? Just think, just for a second, and then I'll compare with my list here. Okay. Scheduled sleep times. Having a set time every single night that you go to sleep. Get your body in that basically rhythm of falling asleep at the same time and waking up at the same time, right? Set wake up time. So even though it's on a weekend versus a weekday, you should still be waking up at the same time. Make it 6.30 every single day and your body will adapt to it. Have a comfortable setting. So have a cool room and a dark room. Have things around you that remind yourself of comfort, whether that's a dog or more pillows or a special pillow, whatever it might be. Have something around you that signifies comfort to you. A cool room, 67 to 70 degrees. You can go colder, but then waking up might be really hard because rolling out of bed when it's like 60 degrees really sucks. So, 70, that's fine. 70 or a little bit lower is really good for recovery as well. Lots of pillows depending on position. We actually learned this uh, in our health and wellness class. Uh, our professor, professor Jay was showing a bunch of slides that you actually need more pillows than what you think, right? Even for sleeping on the back, you need one to two pillows for your head and neck. Then you need one behind your knees. And then you're supposed to have two pillows on each side of your arms here. And that's how you're supposed to sleep on your back. Most people don't do that, right? You need a lot of pillows, way more than what you expect. So, the last two here, no phone one hour before bed and no TV in the bedroom. My wife might kill me because she has a TV in the bedroom and she always falls asleep to the TV. I cannot do that. That's excess light and noise that I cannot fall asleep to at all. So, hopefully some of your things matched up with what I have. Maybe yours is completely different. Here, you just divide your weight by 2.2, and that's how you get your kg, right? And that gives you that optimal protein intake that you need for strength. However, there's been tons of studies done going up to two or even 2.2 grams per kg, and that still shows amazing benefit with no disruption of the gut or anything like that either. So, if you're on a weight loss diet, if you are trying to cut weight and you're in a caloric deficit, then you may be required to uh, increase yeah, more protein may be required to decrease muscle loss, okay? Use high quality protein. So animal proteins is a really good source of that. Um, it has a lot of leucine content, a lot of B vitamins, everything to help it absorb better, okay? Sufficient protein intake after exercise is highly recommended. This is when the muscle is most receptive to amino acids. So the protein's getting broken down and actually into that muscle, okay? It increases muscle protein synthesis, which is just the adaptive responses of the body that results in building muscle. Okay, this is really quick. Nutrition continued. Carbs are very important after a training session for sure. And you should have five to six grams per kg of body weight for strength athletes. Okay, once again, take your weight, divide it by 2.2, and then five to six grams per kg of body weight. So, this is really important here. Remember this ratio of three to one or four to one? This is fantastic for after a session. So for every gram of protein that you have, have three to four carbs, okay? That will help replenish your glycogen stores and help with recovery as well. Keep it simple, simple carbs. You know what I mean? Anyone? Simple carbs, easily digest, come on. Okay, so last thing, good programming really matters. Take into account from Teague from fatigue from all aspects of your life, not just the gym, because your body responds the same way to outside stress, like from school, work, family, whatever, as it does the physical stress from inside of the gym, right? Your body just recognizes, oh my gosh, this is a stressor. 
what's going on, and it responds to it, right? So don't let your cup overfill. This is also from Jay, from our class of health and wellness. Don't let your cup fill all the way up, right? If you have pain, you have joint issues, you have poor sleep, hopefully not. Hopefully you'll go home and get some good sleep tonight. Poor nutrition, stress, that all fills the same cup, right? And if you let it overfill, that can lead to injuries, okay? And that leads me into the final topic right here. This, <laughs> see all these words? This is my disclaimer, okay? Programming through injury is my last topic that I'm talking about. But if it is a serious injury, go see a medical professional, okay? If it's something chronic, if it's something broken or torn, go see a medical professional. Don't listen to these guidelines that I'm about to give you, okay? Follow the guidelines that were provided to you if you went to a medical professional like a doctor, a PT, Cairo, whatever it might be, okay? Follow those guidelines. They're well-educated, okay? It can be applicable to acute injuries, so these principles I'm gonna give you here in just a second for acute little bang-ups and, and acute, I guess I should define. PT students here, what's acute? Just happen. So a really good way to think about acute is the six rule. So six weeks or earlier, right? That's acute, okay? So lastly, everyone should be doing their best to avoid injury with proper warmups like what Sam was talking about and recovery. But sometimes injuries happen, especially if we're loading up the weight very heavy, doing a lot of sets, doing a lot of reps. So, okay. This real life example is me, so I'm okay to talk about it. So I had a hip injury for a very long time. My hip was pinching in the bottom of a squat every single time, okay? It was random onset, it was acute and specific to the squat movement, meaning I could do leg press, I could do lunges, I could do basically any other lower body exercise without pain, but squat was killing me. It hurt so bad. So then these are some questions that you should ask yourself. What changed? What changed recently? Was it the volume? Were you increasing the load? Because that can lead to injury. Or was it your form? Okay? So the goal for me was to not stop squatting, right? We all work very hard for our gains. We're trying to get that new one rep max. We don't want to stop lifting. We don't want to just brush off squats. It's very important. So what should you do? The first thing you should do is decrease the load and decrease the volume. This is the first step and the first principle I want you to follow if you have a little bang up from lifting. Decrease the load, decrease the volume, hit the brakes, take a step back and reevaluate what's going on. Oh yes, let's go. Okay, modify the movement. This is the second step that I want you to follow. Modify the movement to essentially decrease the range of motion. So for me, if I got to this step, I would start doing box squats. So that way I'm not going as low and stressing those structures that were painful. And lastly, rest from that movement. We don't wanna to get to this point. Like I said, we work really hard for our gains, especially strength gains. If you've been training for a long time, you don't wanna stop the movement, right? But it might be necessary if these two first steps don't work for you, you might need to rest from that movement and replace it with the ones that aren't painful. So like leg extension, glute ham raise, anything like leg press. Leg press wasn't painful for me, right? Quick little tidbit here. I know you guys probably can't read it, it's very small, but what it says is because you have decreased load and decreased volume, you should have somewhat more energy and more time to be able to focus on stretching, mobility, warm-up protocols like what Sam talked about, and you should be using like pain modalities like even NSAIDs at home or stretching, foam rolling, massage guns, anything like that to help that recovery, okay? So what did I do? I followed the first principle. What's the first principle? Decrease load, decrease volume. What was the issue? It was a form issue that I actually did not realize until I was actually recording my sets with the decreased load and the decreased volume. And I realized, wow, as the weight keeps going up, my stance keeps getting wider and wider for a wider base of support, right? I was only able to notice, like I said, when I had videos, videos are super important comparing it to heavy sets from before the injury. But wide stance squat is not a bad thing. I, I wanna emphasize this. 
But for my hip anatomy, it was very painful to have a wide stance squat. I have very narrow hips, if you will. So <laughs> it was causing serious pain. So always stick to the form that is comfortable for you as long as it is safe and effective, okay? Luckily, able to stop the pain and get back on track just by using the first principle. I didn't let the injury progress. I wanted to progress, not the injury, right? So what happens next? Let's say you're like me and you're coming back from a hip injury or a shoulder injury and you figured it out, it wasn't a serious chronic injury, what do you do? So in order to return to previous volume and load, it can be a very long journey, but it should start off very slow. So I wanna emphasize this next bullet point. Don't rush it, take your time. You just got done with an injury, right? It still might be painful at end ranges. So don't rush it, start slow. Starting off with one to two sets of high reps, 15 to 20, almost like a hypertrophy level, maybe even a little bit beyond that, at RPE five, five out of 10. That's really easy stuff, okay? That's a great place to start. Start initiating that movement, get full range of motion, and start testing yourself a little bit, like, is this painful, right? Ramp up the volume and load slowly, a lot slower than you would, would normally, right? So you guys remember that chart where volume drops, load increase? You guys remember that? You can do that, but do it a lot slower. Give yourself more time, more weeks, because you're recovering from an injury, okay? Pay attention to your body and how the movement feels. If it doesn't feel right, take a step back and reevaluate. Ask yourself those questions again. What changed? Form, volume, load, any of those things, right? Think about it like a deload block. Focus on the movement itself, not the weight. The weight is not the thing we are focusing on. We're going through the motions, okay? Making sure we feel okay. Final thoughts? Don't let the injury progress. We want to be the one progressing, not the injury. Take initiative to prevent chronic injury by stopping it early on. A lot of people, a lot of gym goers, like to just show up and say, oh, you know what? This pain will go away. I'm just going to push through the pain. It's fine. It'll, it'll sort itself out. Don't do that. Take one step back if it allows you to take two steps forward in your training, okay? That's very important. Take your time, be patient, realize that it's just part of the process with progressing. It happens to most of the athletes I train myself. I know Sam has injuries as well. It happens. We're increasing the amount of force you can produce. We're increasing muscle size. We're doing bodily changes that might lead to an injury. It happens. So just take it slow. Be safe prioritize your recovery, and train smart. There's my work cited. And now there's a survey. Everyone, please scan it with your phones. So this kind of tells how, me and Sam how we did, especially for those of you that are students at NAU, you have to fill in your email. Should work. Oh, too much. You can come up afterward, too. You can come up afterward. But what's up? That's Sam. Did you hear the question? Yeah. 